Welcome, everyone. I'm fully aware that we are very close to the lunch, so we will try to speed it up so that you <laughs> will be able uh, to actually focus on the important things. Uh, my name is Mate. I have Martin with me, and today we will quickly go through what the batch working group has been up to over the past year and what are the plans for, for the upcoming features. So quickly, uh, the most important things is when we meet and where you can find us. Uh, we meet every other Thursday. There are times in various time zones, not all, but a lot. Uh, we have a Slack channel. That's probably one of the best options how to reach us on the Kubernetes Slack as well as a, an, an email group. Both have reasonable volume, so feel free to sign up and, and join uh, both channels. So what we are up to in the first place, what the batch working group is behind. So this is literally a place, a space for all of us, for the entire community to discuss topics related with broad batch workloads uh, approaches in the Kubernetes ecosystem. Uh, our goal is to ensure that people are working on similar problems, more or less, in a one single place, rather than uh, each of us building a solution on their own in, in various different locations. So this is an important thing we are sharing. This is one of the main goals of the Kubernetes uh, community as well, is to share our opinions, our solutions, we are very open to hearing what people are struggling with, what kind of solutions they are implementing, how they are implementing. Uh, we are trying to be very open and inviting everyone if they are already implementing some kind of work, uh, batch workloads on their Kubernetes clusters, or they are currently struggling to show up, to present their ideas, to present uh, their solution, their tooling, and how we could all collaborate uh, to create a common set of tools, because obviously it won't be one single tool, one single solution, but we would like to somehow combine all those ideas into a common shared set, because together we can definitely um, reach a better and, uh, and much more uh, approachable solutions. The key stakeholders uh, is basically a uh, special intergroup Scheduling, apps, node, and auto scaling. I'll quickly mention why each of them. Uh, so if you look at the scope and the six that I did just mention, uh, you quickly notice that the batch APIs uh, falls under the, uh, the special interest groups uh, apps. They are responsible for all the controllers. And within the batch workloads, we are focusing on jobs and cron jobs specifically. Uh, by extending those APIs, and I'll be talking a little bit more about those uh, right in a moment. Uh, we are also working on queuing primitives, so we're trying to involve um, the knowledge that we have from the scheduling work group as well as the controllers, so the apps work group to, uh, to improve the scheduling uh, primitives and queuing primitives. Uh, we are using folks from the autoscaler uh, special interest groups to better utilize the cluster resources, to pack more resources, to literally get as much as possible out of the clusters. And lastly, from the SIG node, we're working with the node working group who are primarily responsible for the node to allow uh, additional specific, uh, specific hardware uh, to work with the Kubernetes clusters. Um, so quickly about a couple of features that we've recently added to the jobs. One of them is Elastic Index Jobs. Uh, so if you remember, jobs, uh, whether that's index jobs or regular jobs, have a limitation that you cannot modify um, the completions once uh, you set a particular value to them. You can modify parallelism, which basically means how many jobs, uh, how many pods are created for a job at any given point in time, but you cannot modify uh, completions. There are some use cases where we would love to be able to modify that. So we extended the, um, the index jobs API with the ability to modify completions and parallelism, um, but you have to do it together. So if you combine those actions at once, it will be a valid action and you are uh, able to do it. 
And this is a beta feature since Kubernetes 127. So basically two versions ago and beta base means it, the feature is available by default in the cluster. Uh, the next feature that is that has been in the works for I would say three or four releases by now, and we'll probably um, we will be iterating on it a little bit more, is the pod failure policy for jobs. So previously, jobs had a very strict policy: either the pod succeeded or failed, and it counted it one way or the other. Uh, the author of a job did not have a control over. Uh, identifying certain failures as being um, not important. The pod failure policy allows the author of the pod to specify that certain pod conditions, whether that was because um, a pod was evicted due to cluster, uh, a specific node exhaustion, or whether because uh, there was an image pool uh, failure. So there are a set of pod conditions or exit codes from pods that we can say, yeah, this is an expected failure, so don't count it, but actually retry uh, those particular failures. This allows us to improve uh, the success rates in, in a lot of those jobs. Uh, another one that is also uh, a recent addition is uh, pod replacements for jobs. So uh, normally a pretty much every single controller within the Kubernetes world, and that's why we started the jobs controller and wrote the job controller in a similar fashion was that you will replace a pod as soon as it uh, reports that it's not healthy or it's uh, planned to be deleted. Uh, the reason for that action was to ensure that the application is available all the time as much as possible. But there are some cases, especially in the batch uh, use cases, where you are running at your limits or you are basically um, have a very uh, assigned quota where you, you can only fit this much and you cannot exceed it. For those cases, the, uh, the requirement to replace the pods immediately is not always possible. Also, when you're using specialized hardware, you actually need to wait for the hardware to be released to be able to reuse it again. So for those cases, we introduced um, a new pod replacement policy, which allows you to actually wait for the pod to, uh, to be failed, but that basically means either succeeded or failed, uh, and only then replace it, rather than replacing it as soon as it go, uh, goes terminating. Uh, one additional thing that I wanted to talk about is job set. It's not a default feature in the, Kubernetes, in the standard core Kubernetes. It's an add-on, so that's an important uh, differentiation. You have to explicitly uh, get that installed to uh, to have it working in the cluster. Uh, if you know how you've been, if, if you've ever been working with jobs, uh, an important limitation of a job is that it only allows to provide you a single template of a pod. Job set is actually a next step further in the journey because it allows you to specify multiple uh, pod templates. And then based on that, you can configure how the success rates, uh, how the success policy for those, uh, for those various uh, templates will look like. So you can have separate leader job or worker job, and then based on uh, your requirements for your job, uh, you can specify which failures or which successes actually matter uh, to complete this particular job. And just because we are uh, putting this under a single package, you can unify the life cycle of the particular job. So with that, I'll pass over to Martin to talk about Q. Uh, hi. So probably the biggest endeavor that we have in batch working group is a project called Q. It was started about uh, uh, two years ago and is trying to solve a number of problems that batch user face. For example, which of the uh, training jobs that they have in the cluster should be running at a given time uh, on the limited amount of resources that they have? How to ensure that all pods that belong to a particular job starts uh, quickly? Uh, because many uh, training jobs require all pods to be running to actually proceed. 
having 99% of pods uh, running is not good enough. Another problem is how, how to allow users uh, to use as many of, let's say, spot instances uh, they want, but to limit their own demand reserved capacity. Regular Kubernetes quotas are uh, not very uh, rich in terms of uh, uh, specifying what can the users do. They just allow you to specify uh, one number for the entire namespace. Another problem is how to do all of about that w without replacing uh, regular Kubernetes components like scheduler or other controllers uh, and do it in a cloud environment when uh, nodes come and go and are uh, added when needed. So uh, for that, uh, Q was introduced. Q is basically a kind of batch job scheduling and admission system that decides uh, which jobs that you have in the cluster should run at a given moment and on what type of machines. So it is kind of similar to a Kubernetes scheduler, but there is one major difference. Kubernetes scheduler works on pods and uh, tries to put these pods on nodes. Uh, Q doesn't put any pods on nodes. It decides whether there is enough space in the cluster to run the job and then leaves the actual uh, scheduling to, uh, to scheduler. Q provides uh, advanced resource controls, like you can specify a quota for a particular set of resources, for example, for your reserve capacity or for a particular type of GPU or for and uh, licenses that you may have for com your computation. It allows you also to uh, do some uh, quota sharing between uh, teams. Uh, in regular Kubernetes, uh, you can only have one quota per namespace, and if you are out of your uh, quota in your namespace, then, well, you, you are done. You cannot borrow it from the other team, even though they are not running much in their uh, namespace. Moreover, uh, Q uh, allows you to have uh, different uh, policies around uh, preemptions, how they are done, how they are performed, and how these resources the, that w you might have been borrowing in the previous steps are reclaimed when the owner of these resources is in need. Uh, and um, what's important, Q doesn't replace any of uh, Kubernetes components. So it works with regular uh, uh, Kubernetes scheduler, it works with cluster autoscaler, it works with Carpenter, with whatever you have there, it will work with it. Moreover, uh, one of the main uh, goal of Q, Q was to meet uh, users where they are. So to do that, Q provides integration with major APIs that are out there. So first of all, we have native uh, integration with regular Kubernetes jobs. We have integration with uh, Kubeflow job portfolio, so MPI jobs, Python jobs, TensorFlow jobs, and all others. Uh, we understand uh, RAID jobs, job sets, and even uh, work with standalone pods if it's, that's what you have. By integration, we I uh, mean that we understand what are the requirements of these jobs, how much capacity they uh, need, uh, where they then run, and we are able to start and s stop them when needed so that uh, the quotas that you defined in your cluster are not exceeded. Okay, so uh, Q resource model is uh, Relatively simple, so you uh, queue admits jobs via uh, queue, as you, uh, the name suggests. So if you create a job, you just need to specify which queue it belongs, and then queue will automatically uh, pick it up. For each of uh, the queues, you can specify a quota of a particular set of resources. For example, in one queue may have uh, 50 CPUs, 20, uh, 100 NVIDIA GPUs, and 200 gigabytes of its disposal. As and long as this quota is not exceeded, it can admit workloads. So the flow here there is relatively simple. Workloads comes, it has an annotation saying which queue it belongs. Uh, we check the quota. If there is enough quota, the workload is uh, started. If there could be enough quota, if some preemptions were made, then these preemptions were done. If uh, preemptions would not happen, the workload uh, 
is suspended and it stays in this state until there is enough resources uh, in uh, the quota. For example, because some of the earlier started tasks have just finished. But the previous model is not enough to cover all of the use cases that batch, work, uh, batch users may have. Uh, so in Q0.5, uh, which we released uh, just a week ago, we introduce a kind of plugin mechanism where you can uh, influence whether the workload is admitted or not. So instead of just uh, doing the basic quota check, we allow to define for each of the queue some additional checks that needs to be performed in order to admit the workloads. These additional checks can be implemented either in the queue or in a standalone uh, controller that is uh, provided by you and matches your uh, company's need. For example, it could uh, block uh, workloads that exceeded their monthly budget. You could issue a Prometheus uh, query in this admission check, check how many CPU hours uh, this particular user used in the past month and based on it decides whether the workload could run or not. Or we could use this mechanism of additional checks to talk to cluster autoscaler. So quota mechanism provides you some form of uh, guarantee that your workload will be started. Uh, if you have a quota and the workload uh, fits in this quota, there are chances that it will actually start. But the reality is that, for example, uh, many clouds are struggling with availability of these new fancy shiny GPUs. And even though you have quota, you, these GPUs may not be available on uh, demand immediately. So, uh, we introduced, uh, in cooperation with SIG Autoscaling, a thing called provisioning request. It's an open source API to cl ask Cluster Autoscaler or any other uh, autoscaling controller to ensure that there is uh, a space for the given set of pods. So in the API, you provide pod template, you provide the number of pods, you, per move, you decide which type of uh, machines you, could, you would like to have and what engine should be, should be used for provisioning. And then Cluster Autoscaler will try to make sure that uh, these resources are provided. And this provisioning request will be in pending state until Cluster Autoscaler is sure that these resources are there. Q will monitor this thing and suspend the, uh, your workload until a cluster autoscaler gives it a green light to proceed. This strengthens atomicity guarantees around gang scheduling that uh, uh, Q provides. So not only will we be checking quota, but we'll also be talking to the underlying infrastructure to make sure that you have resources uh, for the job that is started so we don't partially start jobs and we will not lose your money. Uh, there uh, are you know, three classes that are being worked on in Cluster Autoscale right now. So uh, well, the first one is to just check the capacity without actually provisioning it. It's a class that could be used, for example, in an on-prem scenario. Previously, Cluster Autoscaler didn't make sense, a lot of sense in uh, your on-prem environment, but if Cluster Autoscaler could give you some uh, s uh, answers to uh, whether s s uh, a job could be scheduled or not, then it um, would make sense in uh, on-prem environment. The second class that we are working on is generic scale-up, which will try to scale up uh, uh, your notebooks in your cluster, and if it doesn't succeed, we will back off, or if your uh, cloud provider says as a uh, return as an error, we back off. And the other one is GK specific, uh, that's a new thing on GK, it's based on Q resources that could be uh, asked for uh, on Google Cloud Platform. Okay. Uh, 
The other thing that uh, we are uh, working on is uh, tackling the problem of multi-cluster in uh, batch environment. And the reason why we need a uh, uh, multi-cluster is to also solve the, the GPU obtainability problems, especially for spots on demons, uh, which has availability on different locations at different times. We would also like to help users that have uh, clusters in single regions, but they have many of them, or maybe they have multiple cluster in multiple regions, or even though are on multiple clouds and on-prem at the same time, and would like to have a way of uh, starting uh, the jobs in all of these places in a very convenient way. So basically, we're, the user has a number of clusters. He, in each of them, of course, secure and maybe cluster autoscaler. And we would like to put a job definition in the cluster that is most uh, likely to admit it. So one of the uh, approaches that we could use is to create a, a job definition in all of the clusters, hoping that one of the cluster will eventually pick it up. And then we would remove the uh, job from other remaining clusters and the job will continue uh, execution in the cluster that uh, picked it up in initially. Of course, you don't want to create this uh, uh, jobs uh, definition in all the cluster manually. You would like to have a controller that will do it for you. Such a controller could be Q running in another cluster. Then Q using admission uh, checks that we talked about earlier about would uh, create job definition in all of the worker cluster, may see which cluster admits it, and uh, remove uh, uh, the job definition in the other cluster. So that you could only submit the job to management cluster, and then it would be distributed to one of the clusters. Q will also make sure that the job status uh, or in this management cluster is reflecting the status of a job running in one of the worker clusters. So you could only uh, monitor your uh, management cluster and get the full status of the job there. This is a nice architecture, but probably you would like something like that without a management cluster. So share the role of management cluster and uh, the worker cluster and have it distributing the job across your other clusters. So uh, we are st currently working on this architecture. We start working on it and hopefully we'll have some working prototype in the next Q release, which will come January, Feb in January to February timeframe. But eventually we are aiming at this one, but this will obviously come later because it's a slightly more complicated approach. The pros of uh, multi queues are that no uh, new APIs will be needed for running your jobs. It will work with all of this uh, queue integration we talked about earlier. We would use the same binary in the worker and uh, management cluster. It will work with uh, uh, auto-scaling via provisioning requests, and hopefully it will work across regions, clouds, and on-prems. It won't, won't address the storage problems. It will be a good tool for uh, jobs that are more or less location flexible and don't require petabytes of data that needs to be in the region. Uh, for the first release, you will need to set up a management cluster. Uh, you'll need to ensure that uh, roles and authentications uh, are set up correctly between the clusters and uh, you will need to uh, sync the and namespaces across all of them. That's our idea. That's what we are working. That's what we are discussing. If you have some uh, comments, concerns, questions, or ideas for improvements, please reach out either uh, to us either after this session or on batch working groups. Uh, but this multi queue thing is not the only thing that is coming to queue in near future. Uh, in queue right now, we have a two-level hierarchy of uh, quota. But it's not uh, enough for many companies that would like to uh, build a queue structure for multiple teams and multiple sub-teams with 
complicated borrowing uh, and sharing rules. So we are uh, starting to work on hierarchical quota structure in queue. Uh, we learned that a lot of users are uh, happy with tools that Slurm provide that allow you to the, talk to your queues to check their status and have a, a really nice experience for that. So we are ho hoping to have uh, dedicated command line tools for queue really soon. Uh, we are working on hybrid resource assignments. Right now, uh, queue assigns only one type of resources to your jobs, uh, but maybe some of the jobs could uh, uh, run on different architectures, on different uh, GPUs at the same time. We hope to have some budget implementation and we hope to uh, enhance visibility uh, into what is going on in your uh, batch system, in your queues, via uh, more status and uh, dashboards. And uh, uh, we are planning a lot of other features. So where to find us? Uh, Q.sh is the entry page. We are on GitHub. Uh, if you have questions, then batch working group on Slack would be great. And as a reminder, we run biweekly meetings of batch working groups on Thursday. And it would be a great place to ask questions if you have any of them about queues. OK, and now it's time for your questions. And there is a mic in the center of the room, so please use it. May I ask a question? Can you hear me? Yes, I yep. do. OK, thanks for the great update. Yeah, I'm Yuan Chen from Apple. So I have two questions. Yeah, the first one is, yeah, very nice, the, all this Q feature, other thing. And can you and the comment on, we have also other uh, independent external and uh, batch system, like Unicorn, Volcano, and mm -hmm. even I know people run Snurm and the HPC scheduled on top of the Kubernetes. So how do you think the ecosystem, the Kubernetes in the future, right? There are not efforts now in the, in the Kubernetes native and uh, yeah, the features and the functions like uh, what you are talking about, but there are also other efforts, right? Have other independent systems to try to address this. They have mm -hmm. the queue features, they have some the, uh, advanced scheduling features and quarter management, other thing. The second question is more and uh, about uh, any AI, in particular, given the <laughs> emerging and the generative and the AI and uh, uh, large language models, any specific efforts to address the needs, right, from this and the large scale AI and the workloads, right, heterogeneous and the hardware and mm -hmm. uh, dynamic resource allocation and the network topology awareness and all these and the new features. So, any efforts about that? Okay, thank you. Yeah. Uh, okay, so the first question. Uh, why do you need Q if you have Volcano and uh, Unicorn and, uh, and Slurm? More or less, right? Uh, so uh, all of these tools solve uh, slightly different problems and have slightly different design principles. For example, Volcano uh, this, uh, is um, targeted mainly on, it is my opinion, on on-prem uh, environments where uh, things in the cluster don't change much. It doesn't work uh, particularly great with uh, auto-scaling things. And one of the principles that we have during queue design is to make sure that it will work well in uh, cloud environments. Uh, you can, uh, this more also kind of applies to uh, Unicorn. Uh, Slam is a completely different beast. It has been around for uh, years, if not decades. And it has its own uh, users. Uh, why do you need uh, Q if you have, if you could have Slurm? For example, because you just want to have one environment in your company. If you pick Slurm, and then you may need a solution for your serving uh, services and deployments. And with two uh, environments, you will have to have two set of uh, IAM's roles, two, uh, two uh, uh, duplicated efforts in maintaining all of these environments, duplicated training, dup uh, duplicated procedures, and, on so, and so on and so on. So Slurm at this moment provides much more uh, 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 features than Q will provide. It has very advanced uh, scheduling capabilities. It has great tools. All of that is 
uh, really nice. But the problem now is that it's yet another environment that you need to maintain, and it's not uh, uh, great for everyone. And some people don't have that sophisticated needs to have uh, so much control over how things are executed. And they might be good in, uh, with uh, slightly simpler solution like Q, which will address their needs and allow them to have just a single type of environment in their company. Uh, okay, the second uh, question. Uh, yeah, so can you comment anything, any efforts or working progress for the AI specific workload? Uh, so uh, network uh, aware uh, scheduling, like we're, this is more of a scheduler, a six scheduler app, so we don't have any uh, efforts started. Sir? Just yeah. Uh, the, the <laughs> It's, it's somehow addressed to, uh, by uh, job set, but uh, we understand that more things will need to be developed to ensure that uh, uh, proper management of uh, groups inside of large language model training are handled, that if a group fail, then it might be needed to replace a group of pods. So if you have single pod fail, then maybe a group of pods needs to be moved elsewhere. So there are, there is a lot of quite complex needs that still need to be addressed. We, we are uh, getting user needs, but at this moment, apart from job set, uh, we don't have anything ready. But if you have any particular needs, please, please talk to, to us after these sessions. We would be more than happy to learn them, and hopefully we will have a good solution for you in the future. Uh, okay. I'll comment Thank a little you. bit on the uh, on the uh, support for the hardware. It was also mentioned earlier today during keynote that we are working through the dynamic resource allocation uh, feature. Uh, the problem with that one is highly embedded in Kubelet. And there was a session yesterday during the contributor summit where we were discussing ver uh, how API, the Cube API, is so extensible but at the same time, how Kubelet is very tightly coupled and how far, how hard it is to actually expand the functionality within the Kubelet, which when it comes to actually reusing various um, uh, hardware features is critical. So I, I've personally got like a couple of days prior, one of the freeze, previous one, I think, uh, to review the controller side of the DRA um, it's a massive change in the Kubernetes code base. Um, we are making progress on that front, uh, but I think it'll, it'll be uh, a little bit longer until we get to the point where we will be satisfied with the state of the future uh, to be able to, uh, to mark it as a stable future. But if you, if you can, um, and I would encourage each and every single one of you to try to use alpha or beta features in the early stages in your staging environments or testing environments, provide the feedback, see whether the use cases that you have are fulfilled or where are the gaps that you think it would be beneficial for the entire community uh, to either uh, show up during the batch working group and discuss those topics or for the specific six, because for Kubelet, uh, the, a lot of the DRA um, is happening in the Kubelet, but not only there, because it, like I said, it cross, crosses uh, several SIGs. Yeah, thank you very much. Yeah. Have we, we have time for like one last yeah. question. Hi, this is Abhishek from IBM Research. Uh, I have a question on the job set API. At least on the screenshot, I saw that job set supports multiple job templates. Is there um, any roadmap to support arbitrary CRs in the job set? For instance, can I paste in Spark templates inside job sets? Um, it's funny that you're bringing this up because that's also brought up yesterday during the contributor summit. And there's an issue if you look back in the Kubernetes repository about being able to use even jobs or, or not only jobs. Uh, or even sometimes other controllers as wrappers around literally any kind of generic resources, CRDs or not. Uh, as it currently stands, 
the, the API side of things um, is not as flexible as we would want it to be to allow us supporting uh, this kind of extensions. And that's why for now we're focusing on, on jobs specifically only. All right, thank you. Thank you very much all.